Y'all ready to get into it? All right, so uh, to, we are in a series called Love Never Lies, and we're talking about the fact that the world would look at uh, Christianity and say, hey, you guys should be nice and kind and loving and tolerant because that was what Jesus would do. But we're going back into the scripture to find out what would Jesus actually do. Uh, and so I'm not in this series trying to make anyone in Christianity confrontational. What we're trying to do is keep Christianity from being passive and tolerant because passivity and tolerance is not what Christ is about. And today I want to talk about one of the most unique issues in scripture that people look at and wonder what is that about and why was he like that? I want to talk about how Jesus dealt with the money changers in the temple. You guys know this story and we're gonna read it in just a minute, but I need you to do me a favor. I need you to buckle up because it's gonna be a bumpy ride this morning. Listen, we're gonna be talking about blessings, but maybe we're gonna go a direction you're not ready for, but we'll see when we get there. So here's the scene. Uh, in this day of Jesus being there, every God follower has to go to the temple and offer sacrifices. And those sacrifices can include doves, they can include sheep, pigeons, cattle, different types of sacrifices. And many people had to travel great distances to get to the temple in order to bring it, which means if you're sacrificing cattle or sheep, you're bringing those with you, maybe. And so therefore, the merchants of the day say, hey, if you're coming a four-day journey to the temple, that's a hard way to bring a cattle all the way here or a sheep. So what we'll do is when you get here, here, we'll have sheep ready and we'll sell you the sheep so that you don't have to transport it here. And so it looks like they're finding a way to help out the person who has to give a sacrifice. Uh, they make a profit. Uh, their life was a little easier in bringing a sacrifice, but Jesus doesn't seem to like this business. Mark 11, Mark 11, 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned their tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, is it not written, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. Uh, we learn a little bit more about this interaction uh, in John 2. In John 2, uh, another recording of the same story says this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, I'm in verse 13, Jesus went up to the Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. And so he made a whip out of cords. And he drove them all from the temple courts, both the sheep and the cattle, and he scattered the coins and money changers, and he overturned their tables. So there he is, passive, kind, loving, tender Jesus, with a whip in his hand, turning over tables. So here's what the world would tell you that our kind, passive, tolerant, loving Jesus would have done. He would have calmly stated to them, folks, this is an inappropriate place for you to set up tables. Uh, I know that your hearts are right. I don't want to offend you, but this is a problem. So I'm gonna ask you to have all this removed by the end of the day and we won't do this starting tomorrow, okay? Because this is wrong and I need to teach you guys not to do this. No, he didn't do that. Dude makes a whip makes a whip and goes through and says, get out, turning over tables, running animals out, saying, you're not gonna do this here. And what do we learn from this story? That Jesus hates uh, the church making a profit and you can't buy your sacrifice. And Jesus doesn't want anything sold at the church and every church uh, event should be free <laughs> because if not, those churches are just money grubbing people. And I don't know about you, but it really seems like Jesus lost his cool here. 
It seems like this in control savior just kind of went a little berserk and it doesn't seem to be in control. Like he's got issues and he got a little triggered here. And is it just me or does it seem like Jesus got fired up when he didn't have to? Like he could have just spoken with authority and told them to leave and he wouldn't have to turn over tables or make a whip or chase anybody around. But did you notice when you read this story, Jesus never tells them selling sacrifices is wrong. He never tells them you're, un, you're using unjust scales and you're cheating people. Jesus never says you're taking advantage of these people who are coming to the table. And Jesus doesn't explain anything about why he's upset other than to say this is supposed to be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of robbers. Den of robbers of robbers. That's how he describes what we see. So when we see the phrase den of robbers, what we try to do is extrapolate that Jesus was upset because they were selling sacrifices and somehow at unfair exchange rates and at unfair prices and they were robbing the people. But maybe Maybe there's actually more to the story and more to the reason why he said you guys are a den of robbers because something to me has to make more sense than he comes and he's upset because they're selling animal sacrifices. Not to get that upset, it just doesn't make sense to me that he got so harsh. So I want to set the stage as to what actually happened in this moment. Sacrifices, giving sacrifices to God started all the way back at Cain and Abel. You remember that one from the fruit of the ground and one from the flock, and, and, and that was addressed early, early on, but very, very specific instructions were given to the people in the time of Moses. Under the law, there was a sacrificial system set up. They got to the Mount Sinai, and there was a detailed a list of particular animals, the particular condition of the animals, and particular sacrifices each animal was to be used for. As an example, here is the first time doves as a sacrifice are mentioned in the law in the Bible. It's in Leviticus chapter five. In Leviticus chapter five, it says anyone who cannot afford, everybody say afford. Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves and two pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Now, how this sacrifice system works is you came to the temple once a year, you brought your sacrifice, your sin was transferred to that animal, and then it was sacrificed. It was a picture of Jesus that our sin was transferred to Jesus and he was sacrificed at Calvary. So you have to bring an animal to the sacrifice. So the question is, what's wrong with buying the animal once you get there? Is it different if you bought it wherever you live and you carried it to the temple? I mean, either way, you had to pay money to get this animal that you needed to sacrifice. And if you brought it from home and you did not buy it, that means you had to have had doves and pigeons at home. Stop and think about it. That would mean everyone who followed God had to own already whatever animal they had to sacrifice or they had to buy one. And do we assume that every poor person, because it says you cannot afford a lamb, that every poor person then has doves and pigeons? And they were to bring them from their own flock of doves and pigeons that they had on because we're poor, we don't have a lamb, but we do have a flock of doves and pigeons. Or maybe, maybe what God was saying in making the comment about not being able to afford a lamb is that anyone who can't afford a lamb, you need to use a dove or a pigeon because I know they're not as expensive 
I know you can afford those where you could not afford the lamb. You can't afford to sacrifice your lamb because that's where you're getting your wool, it's where you're getting your milk, uh, maybe future lambs, it's where you're getting your meals. So you can't afford to. So be obedient in what you are sacrificing was the point. I need you to bring a lamb. If you cannot afford a lamb, then I need you to bring two doves and a pigeon. He was saying this is what's important, what you're bringing and what you sacrifice, listen to me, may be dependent on what you can afford. That's critical in the story. But what you can afford would mean what can you pay for? What can you afford to buy at your home? What can you afford to have in a flock? What can you afford to buy at the temple? I hope this makes sense. Buying a sacrifice at the temple is not the problem. People did go to Jerusalem and buy their sacrifice animal because they couldn't carry it, because they couldn't tote it, because they didn't have a lamb at home, because they couldn't afford it, because they didn't have doves and pigeons. And so they went there and they purchased these things for the sacrifices. So why is Jesus so mad that they're doing this at the temple? I'm going to show you. Did you notice that he was quoting another scripture when he called them a den of robbers? If you look in your Bible, you'll see it's in italics or it's set off in some other way to say Jesus is actually quoting some other scripture when he says you guys are a den of robbers. Uh, could it be that the reason he quoted this Jeremiah 7, 11, was because there was more going on in the temple than just buying and selling sacrifices that he was upset about? Let's go back to Jeremiah 7, 11. I want to remind you before I begin to read this, that this is the scripture that Jesus decides to use at the temple. At the temple, when he sees this exchange of animals for sacrifice, for money, this is the scripture he quotes. Jeremiah 7, I'll start in verse 2. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. What this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Reform your ways and your actions and I'll let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is gonna be important, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. My guess is he's quoting a song that they're singing. Verse five, if you really change your ways. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, and if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless of the widow, and you do not shed innocent blood in this place, and you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then, if you do these things, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. So here in Jeremiah's day, God is saying, you call this the temple of your God, but you need to change your ways. You oppress the foreigner, the fatherless widow, you shed innocent blood, and you follow other gods. But then he goes on. There's more to the story in verse eight. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? Verse 10. And then, after you've done those things, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe safe to do all these detestable things? This is God speaking. You say you're safe? You come into my house and say you're safe? You come into my house doing these detestable things and you count on me to provide protection for you? Here in Jeremiah, we're not talking about unfair money exchanges for sacrifices. There's so much more going on that's wrong here than selling animals. God is saying, you act very sinful, you worship other gods, and then you run to my temple and say, we are safe from harm because he's our God. Your deceptive words are that you think this is the temple of the Lord and you're safe here. But actually, you don't know your God and you don't follow your God. God is sarcastically saying, literally sarcastically saying, do you do all of these detestable things and then expect that I'm gonna keep you safe? 
Then comes the familiar line in verse 11. Has this house, which bears my name, God says, become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. So this is what I want you to notice here in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, did he ever say, you guys are buying and selling things in the temple you shouldn't be buying and selling? No. Did he ever say you're exchanging money at an unfair rate? No. Did he ever say you're wrongly selling sacrifices at the temple? No. But this is the verse that Jesus quoted when he said, you guys are a den of robbers. Because he is saying, it's a den of robbers because you want something for God and you are not willing to pay for it with obedience and worship to God. You are a den of robbers because you want to steal God's protection and God's provision without God's obedience and worship to him. You are robbers because you want something for nothing. You want protection from God when you're worshiping Baal. You want your God to take care of you while you're committing adultery. You want your God to provide for you when you commit murder. You want your God to treat you justly while you bear false witness. So just apply that to us today. I told you to buckle up. You want God to provide a heavenly eternity while you enjoy hell on earth? You want your God to protect you while you party all night in drunkenness? You want God to provide for you financially while you spend foolishly and never give into the kingdom? You want God to give you a happy marriage while you look at porn? You want God to give you a ministry while you act like a religious legalist? He's saying you have robbed God by expecting him to do his part when you don't do your part. That's what a den of robbers is. This is why Jesus is upset. This is why he's so radical when he hits the ground and sees the temple. That's just a simple demonstration of something. He's saying the people who come to the temple in this time, they're not serving God. They're out serving Baal. They're out doing their own thing. They're out committing adultery. They're out doing whatever they want in the world. And they come here and say, oh, we're the Lord's. The Lord takes care of us. So what happened? I told you to buckle up. What happens next? Verse 12. Go now to the place in Shiloh. God is speaking. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name. What does that sentence mean? It means they got delivered out of Egypt and they have to go across the desert and come up on the other side of the Jordan River and enter into Israel. And so they go up and they cross and they come to a place called Shiloh. Well, during this journey, God has told them, I want you to erect a tabernacle. It's a precursor to the temple. It'll be laid out like the temple, but I will dwell among my people and you will visit me there and and I will speak to Moses there. And so when you get to the promised land, the very first place you build the tabernacle, not the temple yet, the tabernacle, build it in Shiloh. So now they're in the city, the area of Shiloh, and they built this tabernacle, the first one in the promised land. Go to Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declared the Lord, listen, I spoke to you again and again, and you did not listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. I want you to remember that sentence. I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did at Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in. The place I gave you and your ancestors, I will thrust you from my presence just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. God is saying, I gave you instructions and you didn't listen to them. He's saying, I called you to follow me to come close, but you didn't answer. And so he takes his presence away from the people. At Shiloh, and he says, now I'm gonna do it in Jeremiah's day at the temple. So I wanna know what happened at Shiloh. To find out what happened at Shiloh, you go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 56. 
But they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statues. Like their ancestors, they were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. And when God heard them, he was furious. Don't miss that. When he saw that they were doing detestable things, God was furious and he rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent that he had set up among the humans. God's presence left the tabernacle. He sent the ark of his mighty into capt- of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was furious with his inheritance. The people were his inheritance. Fire consumed young men and young women had no wedding songs and their priests were put to the sword and their widows could not weep. God was angered by their lack of keeping his ways, their disloyalty, their lack of faith, their unreliability, their idol worship. So he rejected them and he left the temple. He left the tabernacle. He said, I'm not staying here while you guys reject me and expect me to take care of you. He left the temple of that day, that tabernacle. But I want to show you what that means for you and me. It was at Shiloh. Do you know what Shiloh means? The word Shiloh means place of rest and peace. Listen to me. This is what happened. They lost their place of rest and peace because they rejected God's ways. They lost their place of rest and peace because they worshiped other gods. They lost their place of rest and peace because they expected their God to take care of them while they rejected their God during the week. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that his spirit dwells in you? I want to go back to the beginning. Why was Jesus so angry at the temple? Not because they were selling doves, not because they were exchanging money, not because they were selling sacrifices to people, but because they had made the house of prayer a den of robbers by expecting God to take care of them while they rejected God. This is Jesus telling the truth at the temple. He knew their hearts. He knew what was going on and he told it like it is. It's the same truth that he tells us today. You cannot expect God to pour out blessings on you while you serve the devil. You cannot expect God to pour blessings out on you while you're sleeping with your girlfriend or boyfriend. You cannot expect God to pour blessings out on you while you verbally abuse your spouse and kids. You cannot expect God to pour up blessings on you while you hold the money that he provides for you to bless others. You cannot expect God to pour up blessings on you while you look at porn. You cannot expect God to pour up blessings on you while you reject who he made you to be in the womb for who you want to be. You cannot expect God to pour out blessings on you while you shed innocent blood in the womb. And you cannot expect God to pour out blessings on you while you make unrighteous decisions based on your own temporal happiness. And if you expect God to bless you while you reject him, you are a robber. Harsh, isn't it? This Jesus dude, this kind and loving, gentle, savior, lamb of God, takes out a whip, says, I'm sick of this. So simple statement, den of robbers. If you want God's blessing, clean up your house. Start listening to God. Don't rob from God by taking his blessings and not serving him in return. But here's a good follow-up question on today. (laughs) Got to break the tension in the room for a moment. (laughs) Do you think in this moment that Jesus was angry? Yes, he was 
because there is a righteous anger. There is a righteous anger for the things of God. There is a righteous anger against the works of the enemy. There is a passion that dwells up inside where we say we will not stand for the work of the enemy in our life and we will get angry about it. And there are times when we watch the world turn away from the things of God and we say we will stand for God and we are angry that our people are doing what they're doing. But people who want blessings from God are people who respect and honor and show obedience to God. And I'm telling you, the majority of the church in America is guilty of claiming God will protect us and provide for us while we dance with the devil while we serve the God of pleasure, while we make justifications for our disobedience, where we misinterpret scripture to make us politically popular, while we sit in silence and let the devil take our children, and while we claim that Jesus would just be kind and nice and tolerant, and while we accept the lies of the enemy so that we can be seen as kind and loving and tolerant like Jesus was, right? Jesus was not passive. The truth is, most of us need a whooping and Jesus knows how to make a belt. <laughs> hey, hey. That is your Facebook post. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a home where discipline came from a leather belt. And the way it worked in my house is my dad was a machinist and he had a key ring on his belt. And when he came to my bedroom, my brother was only 18 months older, so typically if I was in trouble, he was in trouble too. <laughs> my dad would go through what happened and then we would watch him take that key ring, you know, the kind with a chain on it? He would take that and slip it into his pocket. We knew if that went into his pocket, it was over. You didn't have to defend yourself anymore. You didn't have to try to excuse yourself anymore. The whooping was coming. And he would take that belt off and he would grab me by the bicep and he would go in a circle with me. And the vast majority of the time, I deserved it. <laughs> My point is, salvation is a free gift of God. Salvation is offered to you without cost. Salvation is given to you by Christ on a cross and accepting what he did for you. It in scripture is called the free gift of God. But the blessings of God come through obedience. The blessings of God come to obedience and it's not legalism to say that the blessings come at a cost of obedience because Jesus is not happy when people are trying to take advantage of God's blessings without obedience. God is saying in Jeremiah 7, 13, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. Our God is loving and gracious and full of mercy and he is also just and holy and righteous. But love never lies, even when we're hypocritical. Love never lies when we're in idolatry. Love never lies when we are sinful. Love never lies when we're rejecting God. But God is speaking to us about our sin and the question is, are we listening? He's calling us to a righteous life. Will we answer the call? Listen to me, God loves you. God wants to bless you. Are you willing to walk in his ways to receive those blessings or will you be part of a den of robbers? You're here this morning and you're thinking, man, this guy's tough. I know you're talking about Jesus, not me. <laughs> but I want you to hear me. Just like I deserve the discipline my father gave me. You and I deserve the discipline of our eternal father for our sin. And, and God has decided that that discipline, and I want you to hear it clearly out of scripture because it happened in Shiloh. 
He said, you don't want me, I'm out of here. You can spend your eternity with whoever you're serving, but I'm out of here. God is offering to you today an eternity with him, blessings with him, to walk under the protection and the love of the eternal father. So how do you grab a hold of that? Listen, scripture says that God created man. There's no evolution. That's ridiculous when you start actually looking at it. He creates us. He puts us on this planet. He says, it's yours. Enjoy it. I just want to love on you. Don't eat from this tree. And people ask me, why did God put a tree there so we could mess up? Because I'm telling you, if you don't have a choice, you cannot truly love. You have to be able to reject to be able to love. So God was saying, keep your attention on me. We'll walk in the cool of day. You can eat from every tree in the garden. I've given you a beautiful life. Stay with me. Don't eat from the tree. Satan comes into the garden. And Satan says, hey, did he tell you you couldn't eat from that tree? You would die. Death in the Bible is separation from God. Yeah, he said we, we, we would die. No, you're not gonna die. You're gonna be like him. That's what the enemy left heaven for because he wanted to be like God. And he's telling Eve, you will be like him. If you, it's good for food. Uh, it's good to make one wise and you'll be like God. And so Eve is deceived and takes of it and gives to her husband with her. And what have they done? They've defied God. They've mutinied to God. They've said, we don't want to listen to you, God. We want to listen to Satan. We will do what Satan says instead of what you said. And the relationship between God and man is fractured. It's broken. And God comes directly to the garden and he says, did you do this? And they said, well, my wife told me to. <laughs> Men, be a leader. Yes. yes, they did. So God said, I can fix this. I will send my son and he will come to this earth as a man who will be born of a woman. So he'll be flesh and blood. And like you, he will walk out this life, but he will never sin. He will never reject me. He will never do something I told him not to do. He will be sinless. Why would that be important? Because his relationship with God was never broken. When his physical body died, he went straight back to the father. Why? Because he never rejected him. He never sinned. There was no condemnation, punishment, or discipline due him like there is me, Romans 6, 23. All have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. I've sinned. Jesus comes and walks it out without sinning, but then does something amazing. He says, I can go straight back to the Father and spend my eternity with him, but instead, I'll take your punishment. I'll take your whooping from dad. I'll take your sin upon myself. I will pay the punishment for it. Why is that important? Because then you will already have your sins paid for before the Father. I paid for them you will be righteous before him. You see, he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Jesus, in him. This is what Christ is offering you today as the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that if you were willing to believe that he did that for you, then your condemnation is removed, your punishment is removed, and your eternity with God is set. God will send his spirit to live in you and his spirit will give you new desires that you've never had. Desires to follow God. Desires to seek out righteousness. Desires not to reject him. Desires to walk in his ways. It's called salvation. You're saved from an eternity separated from God in a dark, awful place called hell and you're saved to the kingdom of light with the eternal father, the son and the Holy Spirit to be blessed for all eternity. Now I want you to hear Jeremiah seven thirteen again. I spoke to you again and again, but you didn't listen. And I called to you but you didn't answer.
listen, don't let that be today. Answer today. Say, God, I get it. I'm separated from you because I've rejected you. I've denied you. I've sinned. I've done wrong. I did not do what you tell me. But today, I want salvation. Today, I want to believe that Jesus took that condemnation and punishment for me. He took it on the cross. He was separated from you when he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because all of the sin of the world of man is on Jesus and he's dying for it and being separated from God. But the Holy Spirit raises him from the dead three days later and he comes back to tell you I am here to give you eternal life if you would be willing to believe that I took your sin on the cross. If you'd be willing to look to the Father and say save me today. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, not because I got some kind of preacher's trick for you but because I want you alone with yourself. I want you to ask yourself the question, do I believe I need Jesus? Or am I going to try to stand before God and tell him I did more good than bad? I want you to hear me out. All Adam and Eve did to get thrown out of the presence of God was one thing. I've already done my one thing. Have you already done your one thing? Then you're already separated from God. But right now he's calling to you. Will you listen? Will you answer and say, okay, I need what Jesus did for me. I believe he died on that cross to pay for the sinful things that I have done for my entire life. And I want that salvation. I want you to send your Holy Spirit to dwell in me. I want to walk in a new way with new desires. I want to walk in your blessing, God. I want to be in your kingdom and not in the enemy's kingdom. This morning, I accept God. Forgive me. Cleanse me receive me as a child of yours and let me begin to walk in your ways. Bring me out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light and let me experience your spirit. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Thank you for explaining it this morning. Thank you that I heard it today. Thank you that today I will not reject you. Today I will understand that I must make this decision and I must follow you and I must believe in what Jesus did for me so that I can spend an eternity with you and not separated from you. I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes closed for just a moment. Because scripture says that all of heaven rejoices when just one person accepts what Christ had done for them. Maybe today was the day you said, hey, I did. This is me and you. All the eyes are closed in the room. This is me and you. If you made that decision today to accept what Jesus did for you on the cross, would you just raise your hand and show it to me? I see you. I see you. I see you and you and you and you. Praise God. And you, praise God. You guys look up here for a moment. I believe, I believe there are people in the room who said, I know I need this. And today I'm going to accept it, but I'm scared to death. He's going to make me stand up and come to the front of the room. I know you're here. I can feel it in the spirit that you were just worried Let me tell you something. If you accept Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, you will confess the Father before other men. You can't not do it. So this is what I want to say to you. This morning, God has forgiven you. This morning, God has adopted you. God has brought you into the kingdom of God. God is going to send his spirit to dwell in you. God wants to change those struggles, show you ways and things you didn't know, bring you a peace and joy that you have never felt before. How do I know this? I'm testifying to it. It happened to me. Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to ask my altar ministers to come forward. I have a very special request this morning. Some of you who have just accepted Christ for the first time, some of you have never, um, have walked a long time in Christ, but never received a baptism in the Spirit, and never understood what it means for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, and for gifts of the Spirit to become relevant and real for you, and you've always wondered about it. You're thinking, is that thing real? Because a lot of people talk about it, but it's never happened to me, and I don't know, I want it to happen to you this morning. We're going to ask our altar ministers this morning, apart from praying for you for whatever you come up with, that if you want to be baptized in the Spirit, just tell them. Tell them this morning, I want to be baptized in the Spirit. I want to understand this new walk I can have in the things of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And they're going to pray for you to be baptized in the Spirit, and you're going to walk out of here amazed 
amazed at what you see and understand and feel. I wanna thank you for being here this morning and this is what I wanna tell you. This is one of the hardest messages I've ever had to preach. It seems very strong, it seems very condemning, it seems very legalistic. But every once in a while, I'm just gonna be honest, I need a whooping. I need the Lord to tell me, don't play games with me. Be serious with me. Be serious with me and I'll bless you. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus was angered because there was a den of robbers who were expecting things from you with no worship and obedience to you. I thank you that that's not who we are. I declare that in this house, we praise and love a living Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite the Holy Spirit into every aspect of our life, and you are worthy of all, Father God. We lift all praise and all honor to you, to our King, and to the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.